Hard to believe that anyone serious about poetry, either student or teacher, wouldn't want to own this book. Reading sound ideas is like being in a class with the best poet and teacher of your life. McCarthy and Quinn are those poet teachers, ha each having fallen in love with poetry, each having given over their lives to its beauty and power. And this book is that classroom, one which comes alive with force and pleasure, with their shared belief that poetry itself comes truly alive when one speaks and hears it, when it enters the consciousness through that breath and release, when it has the power to change lives. Jean McCarthy comes from Worcester, is an author, educator on English literature, literary figures, and poetry comes originally from Michigan, where he studied English, and then ventured east, where he met his wife and raised his family of five children. He has taught a number of courses at Holy Cross College, where he began with the teaching and writing about literary figures and literature. and. Eventually, after doing some publications, as well as teaching a number of courses, teamed up with Fran Quinn in Worcester, and that is when they worked on creating their book, Sound Ideas, which Jean will speak of today. And it, the title, the full title is Sound Ideas, Hearing and Speaking Poetry. And since then, Eugene, Jean, continued on in his work and uh, created a number of other uh, publications he worked on about literary figures, about poets, their lives as well. And uh, he has been prolific as a writer in publications as well as books. He was also an editor of the Worcester Review and he participates in the Mil Milton Ensemble which he said has enhanced his interest in poetry. And he said, as we offer dramatic performances of books of paradise lost each year, which confirm my belief in the absolute importance of oral reading of poetry. And last, I'd like to end with a quote when I asked Jean why share poetry out loud. And he said, there is an intellectual aspect to poetry, of course, but also a physical bodily aspect the body often knows before the mind does. And an emotional meaning which we can and should understand in order to learn from poems, to learn more about emotions, ours, and others. And with that, I look forward to hearing what Gene McCarthy has to share about his new book. Please give him a warm welcome up. Gene McCarthy. Our book is called Sound Ideas that Fran and I came to write and work on over quite a few years partly because I was very dissatisfied with the strictly reading it off the page academic approach that I was taught and that I used. And I thought there's something else missing here. When I met Fran, whom some of you may know, who's a fine poet, um, he kept talking about hearing poetry. And I said, what does that mean? How do you hear poems? There's the usual you know, repetition of consonants and vowels and so forth. But he kept talking about hearing poems. And I just did not know what that meant, quite literally. And so it took a while to understand that. And once I did, then my teaching changed entirely. And then hearing poems and speaking poems became what really meant a lot to me. We call the book Sound Ideas, partly because as a kind of a pun, that the ideas in it are very sound, of course, since we wrote them. Uh, <laughs> but also that uh, the ideas about the sound of language. And we begin with line, the first chapter, because Line is where we begin with verse. The line is, the, is expression. And our principle is to respect the integrity of the line as written. So that if you listen to the way the line moves, you begin to understand the movement, the feel, the rhythm of the poem. And if you just blow out the lines and just keep going, you're reading prose. You get the information. Whose woods these are, I think I know, whose house is in the village though. If you just kind of whip through that, there's no feel, there's no emotion to it. And so what happens when you read the line and understand that kind of phrasing? If you depend upon and let the poem tell you, then it will lead you 
to speaking it, to hearing it, to speaking it, and understanding not just the intellectual information, but the feeling, the emotion, and the physicality. Because we're talking about body, getting the, pa the poem off the page and into the voice and into the body, frequently through gesture. Begin with <clears throat> William Carlos Williams' poem. Williams is trying to catch the American idiom of phrasing rather than, say, British. Uh, and so he writes this poem called To a Poor Old Woman. The title is part of the phrase itself. And if you read it straight through, of course, it's simply repetition. But if you read it with the phrasing of the line, then you begin to understand what he's getting at. To a poor old woman munching a plum on the street, a paper bag of them in her hand, they taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can tell it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out of her hand. Comforted, a solace of ripe plums seeming to fill the air, they taste good to her. So how do you get expression? How do you get the feeling? How do you get emotion by that momentary pause, that hold, hesitation at the end of the line, because that's what we, how we speak in our common language. This is not alien speech, this is how we speak. We pause, we want to make a, a, a point, don't we? So we, do you know what I mean? That's line break, isn't it? And that's how the poet, you get the natural voice, your, your voice through that line break. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. And every time the repetition comes in, it is a bit different, because that's why we repeat, don't we? Poem by Robert Francis. Lived in Amherst, wrote wonderful poems. And this is called The Sound I Listen For. Now this is both about sound, it's a perfect poem for our book, because it's about the sound of a mower moving along through the following the horses, turning at the end, just as poems turn at the end of the line, come back. So the, the plowman plows, returns, plows, returns. And there's also a sound, the sound of the machinery, the sound of the mower, the speaker, and the horses hearing. <clears throat> what I remember is the ebb and flow of sound that summer morning as the mower came and went and came again crescendo and diminuendo. And always when the sound was loud at, loudest, how it ceased a moment. While he backed the horses for the turn, the rapid clatter giving place to the slow click and the mower's voice. That was the sound I listened for. The voice did what the horses did. It shared the action as sympathetic magic does or incantation. The voice hauled and the horses hauled, the strength of one was in the other, and in the strength was no impatience. Over and over as the mower made his rounds, I heard his voice, and only once or twice he backed and turned and went ahead and spoke no word at all. So if you listen for the line, the sound was loudest, how it ceased, a moment, that hesitation, how it ceased a moment. What do you get from that? The physicality, the emotion of the movement, and the physicality is what I think we're interested in. Here's a poem, though I would not pretend to be a fairly sizable African-American woman, I will venture a Lucille Clifton poem, okay? <laughs> Wonderful poet, sometimes very funny, sometimes very serious. Homage to my hips, okay. I probably shouldn't even try this, but it's about the line. 
These hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. They have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go. They do what they want to do. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and spin him like a top. <laughs> How does she get that? Through the line, huh? That I have known him to put a spell on a man and spin him like a top. That's where the body comes in. That's where the body starts to respond to the emotion, to the rhythms. And I think our chapter three is on rhythm because rhythm is motion and motion is emotion. And I think we do not catch much emotion from the page alone. I think we need to get it into the body, into the voice, the saying of it. Then you hear the pauses, the silences, which are, of course are devastating, aren't they? That long silence and waiting. And where you hear the speed, the, the tempo we call it, the tempo of moving fast through the line or slowly. You can, of course, in a poem again, to repeat, does tell you how fast or slow to say it. Now, when we talk about sound, all our language has sound, right? It's not just onomatopoeia and assonance and so forth. All the words we use have sound, and we select the words in our common speech for the sound effect. Please be quiet. Silence, please. That's different from shut up, because, and we pick words for that, as I suspect we know. You know, when you want to make a point, you say it with a lot of consonants in there. And even vulgarities have a lot of consonants because they are crisp and effective. So we listen to the sound of language because in the sound of language, as in the Robert Francis poem, the wonderful sounds, the mower over the O, O, O sounds, they have an emotional effect. That's what we're listening for. What is the emotion? So that when you hear the sound of the words and you speak them, then you hear that. And so you need to let the poem tell you things. Here's a poem by Stanley Kunitz, the Worcester poet, called The Portrait. <clears throat> Try to listen for the sound that he's getting at here. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself in such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with a pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with deep brown level eyes and a brave mustache, she tore it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I could feel my cheek still burning. The sounds convey the emotional movement. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out. I'm perhaps exaggerating, but you hear that crisp hard as though I could hear him thumping. The boys feel, because his father killed himself before Stanley was born. So he's always searching for his father. And then that wonderful, when I came down from the attic with a pastel portrait of my hand, kind of soft, gentle, she ripped it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. You see what happens, how he manipulates language, sound, to carry the emotion so that you know what's happening physically in him and in the mother. That's what I mean, the sound of language. Chapter three is about rhythm, as I said. <clears throat> rhythm is motion, and motion is emotion. The rhythms of lines, I think you get that when you're starting to speak it. If you listen to the line, listen to the sound, you get that feel, that emotion. It may take a little while to catch on to the rhythms because you may have to say it a number of times. I know we've struggled with a number of poems that are very difficult. And no, that doesn't seem quite right. No, that doesn't seem to get it. Uh, we better try it again. So we keep repeating and reworking to get 
what we feel is the voice of the poet and then put that into my voice. When I'm doing Lucille Clifton, I'm not trying to imitate Clifton. I don't try to imitate Stanley Kunitz, because Kunitz would sort of chant his poems in a kind of a high, delicate voice. But if you say it in your own voice, then you have your, then it comes into your body, and then you have that kind of feeling. <clears throat> rhythm is part of what we want, I think, and listening to the rhythms. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about rhythm because that is where you get the physicality of the poem. So the whole chapter is about rhythm. Uh, and we also talk about meter. That's kind of essential. But that's a separate chapter, because meter is not the same as rhythm. Even the words mean something different. Meter is a measurement of the accents, normal accents, whose woods these are, I think, I know. But you don't say it that way, do you? That's kind of silly. But the meter is there, it's underneath, it's like a, sort of like a drum beat, a pulse underneath, and then you go over that. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. Just the slightest increase on think and village. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. There, too, you hear that sound of oh, 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 and later, ear, air, ache, ache, a lot of sound, a lot of pain in that poem. If you watch the l l rhyme words frequently, the sound of those creates a lot of the power of the poem, the sound that carries through to you, that you may not even know about, but it's, it's coming through to you. Like listening to a soundtrack in a film, it's working on you even if you may not be aware of it as such. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Have to throw in a few Shakespeare poems, don't we? Okay. This is about the conflicts that I feel between meter and rhythm. This is uh, Sonnet 65, which of course you all know, bing like that, right? Does anybody here know sonnets by their number? I don't know. Uh, it's called Since Brass Nor Stone Nor Earth, and so on. Now, if you simply follow the meter, it sounds like since brass, nor stone, nor earth, nor boundless sea, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, as a straight iambic movement, right? But if you say that, it gets, strikes me a bit sing-songy. Since brass, nor stone, nor earth, nor boundless sea, but sad mortality or sways their power. <clears throat> if I hear the poem and listen to what the poem's saying, it doesn't seem like that's really what it does. And as you go through the poem, you find a lot of negations in here, a lot of negatives, because it's all about a paradox about time and my love, and he ends up with saying, what a strange thing it is that in black ink, my love, my beauty still can be celebrated, the kind of paradoxes. And so, Fran and I talked about this a good deal, and he said, I think we should try something a little different to get not the meter as such, but the sense. Since brass, nor a stone, nor earth, nor bound to sea, but sad mortality, or sways their power, how with his rage shall beauty hold a plea, whose action is no stronger than a flower? The, the meter seems to go one way, but the rhythm of the poem seems to go a different way. And I think instead of being locked into meter as a kind of an absolute, I think we need to be able to move and be a little bit flexible in that the meter is there, but something else is going too. A lot of poems, Frost writes in metrical verse, doesn't he? pretty much regular, he liked that, because it gives you an underlying kind of structure. And then, but you go above that to create other things. Okay, um, we talk about imagery, of course, we talk about metaphor, talk about simile, but we talk about them in terms of hearing and speaking them. Now, can you hear a metaphor? Of course you can, you hear it developing, huh? As you hear a theme in music. But our interest is not simply in identifying, you know, check off five metaphors and three similes, and you're home free. No, no, it's what does it do? How does it work in a poem? And what do we need to know to understand metaphor? And what is metaphorical thinking? How do you, how do you, or why do we think in terms of metaphor? What's the difference between that and simile? 
how do we think in terms of simile? What does that mean? And we include in the chapter on metaphor a poem by Seamus Haney called Seeing Things, which is an extraordinary exploration of metaphorical thinking because he's going through a lot of difficulties. It's metaphor but also faith for him, as you would imagine. Can I see connections between things? Can I see the meanings of things, that not just objects, but what they mean, which is metaphorical thinking, isn't it? And so it's an extraordinary piece of work that he goes through to, to, to deal with how one thinks metaphorically. We did originally have a chapter on imagination, but it seemed like it was not necessary, so we cut that out. But I, and I think the whole idea of imagination is probably in the sections on um, metaphor and simile. Our final chapter is memory work. So if you listen to the poems, and if you speak the poems, the next step is to memorize it. Now memory, we suggest that you try to memorize or read the whole poem through, the entire thing through repeatedly until you get the feel for the whole. Not reading it, say, memorizing it stanza by stanza by stanza. I think you need to get the wholeness, the movement, because the voice, movement through the voice, across the line, down the lines, through the stanzas, through the whole thing. That's the wholeness that you need. And so that's what we suggest in memory work. Memory work is also dangerous, isn't it? I don't always necessarily enjoy reciting the portrait. It's a harsh poem. Fran once had his students memorizing war poems, and they said, we won't do it. And of course, we always assign memory, poems to memorize because they thought it was just too terrible an experience. And so poems like, if you read uh, Wilfred Owen, it's not just information and knowledge and seeing, it's the experience of going through that, that thing. It gets at you emotionally, it's hard. But that's, I think, is where we learn about emotions, we understand emotions, we understand because we listen to what others have to say. We understand what Cunitz is motion about. That's valuable to understand what others know and feel. It's not what I feel. It's tell me, tell me, teach me, show me. Let me into this experience if you can dare to. And that's our book. Thank you so much. I ate Renee's still life this morning. A small, ripe, seckle pear taken from a wire basket, hanging above her sink. I washed it first. Too late I learned it was something studied by artists in her watercolor class. Students sketched and painted, examining it, its provocative curves and colors. I ate it quickly, unconscious of its art appeal. I might have used oil sticks of burgundy and moss with speckles of brown and yellow. I might have chosen to pair it with an apple or a persimmon. I ate Renee's still life that rested after a long night's work in the basket next to the blue glass bottles on the windowsill, next to the fresh roses vased from the garden. I ate it and threw its heart into the disposal. It was then, as I ground seed and stem, that she told me what I had done. Love, spread your wings, come fly away with me in your dreams. Leave them all behind, your troubles and your cares, you don't need them. Soaring up above the sleeping world below, Floating just the way we want to be You can take me anywhere I'll follow To end the sea You and me Love, spread your wings Come fly in your dreams Together with me In this wondrous space we can feel so free together, 
I know We can be just who we want to be Find a peace and joy and maybe start again Again with no one but each other In endless sky You and I Soaring up above the sleeping world below Floating just the way we want to be You can take me anywhere I'll follow To end the sea You and me Love, spread your wings Come fly in your dreams Together with me Leave your cares below Gathering dust on earth While we float above Together Love, spread your wings Thank you very much. Peach and pear.